exercise until recently uh, was sort of at the fringes of classical economics. Right? But last year was the third time that a behavioral economist has won the Nobel Prize for economics, Richard Thaler. So I think now behavioral insights have really come into the mainstream. It's a sort of marriage of psychology and economics. Uh, is to show you the limits to classical economists. The behavioral approach thinks about this differently. Rather than kind of assuming these assumptions that, that may or may not be realistic, it recognizes the fact that these assumptions are very, you know, have, have strong limits. So when we think about behavioral insights, a lot of times we think uh, that it's human beings behaving in non-rational ways, ways that we don't expect people to behave. For example, uh, we often think of it as a shorthand for being emotional. We, we are emotional beings, but not the way that you think it is. The two ways of thinking are system one and system two. So this is system one. It's something that we kind of know and we understand and we the narrative is clear. There's no, mm, there's like, we don't sit back and say, hmm, I wonder what that, why he did that, right? System two. One needs more work than the next. And it's not that you can't do it. It's just the fact that you need effort. How we think people decide and how they really decide are quite different. We think people are like Dr. Spock, right? They're like completely rational. And if you don't decide, we say like, it's irrational, right? People who don't read, who don't understand, who don't do the math, they're irrational, but they're not. They're just like us. We can't be bothered. A lot of the times, even uncontroversial problems require a lot of work. And um, that's why even water conservation requires us to think how we're going to do it. So this is really an interesting experiment I did. We all know we should save water, but we use more than we should. So here's my experiment. If you pay people to save water, does it make them save more water than if you told them it is the right thing to do? For both groups, I told them it is a good thing to save water. So this is a big experiment about a thousand households. So for these, both groups, I told them it is a good thing to save, it is a good So both groups got the same kind of moral incentive. One group got money on top of it. So the experiment asks this question. If people knew something was a good thing to do, if you paid them, does it make a difference? So, and it's a real neat experiment. So I paid them $10, $20, and a few hundred dollars. Um, and, and then I gave them these posters. So money or morals. Uh, and this was done in an RCT uh, and uh, 1,000 Singaporean households. So they got, so basically what I was trying to do was to see, do campaign messages like these make a difference? Normative feedback, meaning normative used in a specific sense, not in a good or bad sense, normative in a sense of norms, like telling you you use more or less than your neighbor. And the monetary price. So basically, it's three different kinds of things. Um, a kind of do the right thing message, uh, your pals and other people like you, I mean your neighbors, and some money. Um, so here's a funny thing. Yeah, so I have lots of data, um, and the slides are free to, to, for you, but um, I don't propose to kind of, sh this is only to impress you that, you know, that I actually do have a PhD. So, uh, but it's just to show you what is the overall effect. The overall effect is significant and a 4.2 liter reduction. It doesn't sound like much, but um, it's already 50% of the total saving target by the PUB. Is that per day, per household? Yeah, per, per day. So it's significant in, in that sense. And, and this is even more significant than normal because price incentives fail pretty quickly for water. And, and if you think about it, you kind of will guess a bit why. 
you need to raise water price by heck of a lot to reduce that same percent. So like, I'll give you a concrete example. You need to raise water price. If you raise water price by 10%, you almost get very little, get nothing. Right? So you need to raise it by 33% at the least to get a 10% reduction in water. Demand is relatively inelastic for water, meaning if you want to impact the demand for water via price alone, it's really, really difficult. You have to raise water price by a lot in terms of percentage to get a, a small adjustments in demand. So this is why it's really fun for me to discover that it's a non-price incentive that is significant. So this is the first finding. The second is there is no difference in effect sizes. So, um, so in short, this means that the impact of the moralizing of the morals is no different when coupled with other all other effects. So it doesn't mean that it crowds out any other effect. Uh, in real terms, this means that the only difference is how much water you used in the first place. And not surprisingly, so this one is not surprising, that the people who were most susceptible to the normative effects were the higher, the higher users. People who used more water tended to save more or be more um, uh, what's the word, sensitive to these uh, normative effects. And they can go up to 10 liters. The first thing, the first policy implication, which is really important for me, is to say that any government which says it ra is raising its water price for water conservation reasons has to be really careful. Because you don't get people to save by the price incentive. If you have to, and, and I do support raising water prices to cover costs, but the reason cannot be that you want to use this to motivate converse, cons conservation. Because equally, non-price measures get you the same thing. I do believe that water should be priced at cost recovery. Because if you don't, if you subsidize water across the board, what you're doing is just putting in a really regressive regime. A regressive regime is something that subsidizes the rich as well as the poor. So the correct way for me to subsidize for water, and I think water should be subsidized uh, for the poor households, the correct way to inject and infuse subsidy is not through the pricing, but through the distribution of subsidies. So you price water at cost recovery. Everybody pays the same price. A lot of governments think the poor pays a different price. And then you, the first block is really cheap because everybody gets the first block at a low price. Why? And the argument is that, well, the poor household should get the first block for free. But that's the thing. If you effect the subsidies through pricing, what you're going to do is, is just subsidizing tycoons the same amount as everybody else. So I think that's really bad economics, really. The way to subsidize for me is price set cost recovery and infuse the subsidy only to specific households. Oh, there we are. Uh, my name's Bob Middlestorf. Um, so I have a question about incentives. Uh, you mentioned um, positive or negative incentives. Which do you think uh, might work better? And um, I agree that uh, cost recovery is a great idea, but maybe should high users pay more a negative incentive? Right. No, definitely. Uh, so the, the quick answer to the first one, positive or negative incentives, both work. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. I'll, I'll answer that specifically uh, with, relating, uh, with regards to water. Right? Uh, so the negative incentive, I, I'm guessing, is a tax on high usage. So, and that's commensurate with my earlier recommendation for cost recovery. So from the first drop, you should price at cost recovery. That doesn't prevent you from setting a higher price for higher volume users. 
So I do think indeed that people who are profligate, who are use, wasteful in their use, should indeed be taxed. Uh, because, you know, uh, I, I earlier made the argument that you cannot use price to influence behavior too much. And I say that because we need a minimum amount of water. And that, that, that's essential to life. But you don't need that much. Hamburg uses 101 a day. We use 141. So we are clearly 40% higher than Hamburg, with no good reason. So you know, those of you who are golfers should know that golf courses use a lot of water. Mm -hmm.